Tēnā koutou, ko Sherida tōku ingwa. My name is Sherida Fraser and I'm from the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective National Office in Wellington. Nā mahi mai o hā ki a koutou katoa, nō te whanganui a tāra ahau, ko te kūnina ki pūrihu rō taku mahi, ko Denise Blake tōku ingwa. So my name is Denise Blake, I'm based here in Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I work at Massey University in the Joint Centre for Disaster Research where we aim to address issues around psychosocial well-being around disasters. So Sherida and I are really excited to be here with you today. We're going to present to you some research we've done that explored the plight of sex workers following the 2010-2011 Canterbury earthquake sequence that rocked the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. So during this brief talk, we're going to outline what we do at the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective. We'll give you some context um, around the earthquakes, around one in particular, and we'll provide an overview of our research approach, so our theoretical underpinnings. We'll then present three of our key tropes from the participant nar participants' narratives um, before we present our final thoughts. So I'll hand it over to you, Sherida. Thank you. Um, NZPC, the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective, is um, Aotearoa New Zealand Sex Worker Collective. We're a peer organisation founded in 1987 and we've been funded since 1987 um, by our Ministry of Health for Sexual and Reproductive Health. Um, we do other work around that mahi though, which is um, advocacy, um, upholding the um, rights, safety, health and well-being of sex workers in New Zealand. NZPC was also instrumental in the passing of the Prostitution Reform Act in 2003, which decriminalised sex work for residents and citizens in New Zealand. Okay, so in 2010-2011, Aotearoa experienced a series of earthquakes in the Canterbury region. On the 4th of September 2010, there was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake that occurred at 4.35 a.m. And while there were no direct loss of life from this earthquake, it was one of the most damaging earthquakes that we'd experienced since 1931. On the 22nd of February 2011, a 6.3 earthquake struck at 12.52 p.m. New Zealand time in the middle of the day where people were going about their lives. I'm now gonna play a video to you, it's about one to two minutes long, that showcases some of the events that unfolded during that earthquake. Just a little warning, it can be a little bit kind of distressing. Interrupting regular programming to bring you breaking news. A massive aftershocks just hit Christchurch. Their phone links were cut to the city. Buildings have collapsed. A terrible toll on the southern New Zealand city. The city of Christchurch has been hit with a 6.3 magnitude earthquake. Police in New Zealand have reports of multiple fatalities. Buildings crumble, concrete beams weighing thousands of pounds, crushing cars. New Zealand's Prime Minister has warned residents of Christchurch that the Grand Chancellor Hotel is on the brink of collapse. Rescuers are still searching for survivors. There have been desperate scenes throughout Christchurch today. Nowhere in Christchurch is safe. You've just seen the moments of terror as a deadly quake hit Canterbury. This was the feared big one we've been warned about. I 
feel really moved every time I see that video. I remember it like it was yesterday. So there were 185 deaths from that earthquake. And as you saw, the city centre was destroyed. It was cordoned off due to the extensive damage from the earthquake. That cordon remained in place in some areas until June 2013. So following that earthquake, approximately seven years later, Sherida and I decided to conduct some research. We wanted to know how those earthquakes and the red zoning of Christchurch CBD impacted on sex workers' sense of place and physical space. Christchurch is a popular destination for sex workers. So the research that followed engaged a critical, participatory and a sex worker rights approach. In this way, we respected the human agency and rights and lived experience of our sex workers. So we privileged their voices as the expert. In total, we interviewed 12 sex workers and seven key informants. These key informants comprise of a Christchurch emergency manager who was in Christchurch at that time, New Zealand Prostitutes Collective staff, a street-based outreach worker, and a couple of community-based not-for-profit workers who worked with our street sex workers. We looked at the conditions for sex workers following the earthquakes. It was well into the city's rebuild and recovery process at the time that we did the research. So now Sherrod and I are going to present a couple of snapshots of the three key narratives, displacement, stigma, and legislation. So I'll pass it over to you, Sherida. Thank you. Um, the first theme is the displacement theme. And um, really, when the, red zone, when the central city was red zoned, that displaced over 100 sex workers and the NZPC community base. Um, our community base was in the red zone. Um, there were 10 to 14 brothels in the red zone um, that were all um, now non-accessible. And um, the traditional area where street-based sex workers worked from was in the red zone. So everybody had to find new ways to be and new places to work. For NZPC, they immediately um, started operating out of one of the staff members' garages. So that's where the condoms arrived. The condoms still had to get through because sex workers were still working. Um, so what happened was that um, our staff member got the condoms in her garage and she delivered them to um, residential places where sex workers had uh, carried on working or started working. She said, suddenly I was going into these brothels that I'd never been to before, usually houses. They weren't like commercial buildings or anything. Because of the trust that had built up over the years of um, the peer organisation of NZPC, she was able to be invited into these places to deliver. And um, it was a real testament to the power of the peer organisation and the trust between um, NZPC and the sex work community. For the brothel-based workers, they had nowhere to work. So some of them relocated uh, to other cities in New Zealand. Uh, some of them uh, went to work in these residential houses um, and some of them tried working on the street. This worker said, I've got nowhere to work and stuff. One night I went out to do street work. I've never done that and I make a lousy street worker. It's quite a different context working on the street when you are used to working in a brothel. It felt quite unsafe for this particular worker. Um, but NZPC staff, again, were able to help to organise some of the workers to work together in, um, in residential places. And so it's, again, testament to that trust and community building of a peer organisation. For the street-based workers, um, the traditional area of work on Manchester Street was um, part of the red zone, so many of them worked further up. That caused a lot of, um, in, in, in a residential zone where the houses were, so that caused quite a lot of um, tension between <coughs> the resident community and the sex work community. NZPC worked really hard and quite intensely to um, collaborate 
and work together to build understanding between those residents and the sex workers and over time they were able to move closer and closer back into the red zone. They did also try and work in other places around the city. There was a 24 hour bakery on the other side of the city, but they did find that these places were often um, not so safe. They didn't feel so safe because of the street lighting um, and their clients didn't know where to go to find them. Thanks Sherida. So closely linked to displacement is stigma. And as we all know, sex work remains a highly stigmatized profession. And as such, that creates barriers to accessing life-sustaining welfare services in an extraordinary event. For example, Louise said, yeah, as a person, there's lots of services available, as long as you don't or didn't say you're a sex worker. So we found, like Louise, stigma permeated many aspects of the rebuild. You've just talk, heard Sherida talk about the uproar from the public about street sex workers being in the areas. We also heard about building bureaucracy being problematic for sex workers. For example, one brothel owner talked about struggling to get a resource consent to rebuild their premise. She felt unfairly denied a building consent and was given the runaround. In the end, like Sherida represented, she moved to another city and opened another brothel. brothel. So another worker manager believed that the brothels were the first buildings to be demolished in Christchurch, which symbolised where sex workers can be positioned in particular communities and in societies. So we all know the negative impacts of stigma, which is disasters exacerbate already existing inequalities and increase social isolation and social fragmentation. Sex workers perceived that they had been overlooked by emergency management professionals and government teams after the earthquakes and during the rebuild. However, as Sherrod has expressed, NZPC provided some social capital in terms of mitigating some of those negative effects. So Sophie's narrative accurately represents how sex workers felt after the earthquake and the gratitude towards NZPC. She said, if there wasn't a Christchurch NZPC, we wouldn't have been thought of at all. We'd have just been swept under the mat. So it's only because of NZPC, because of them, they've given us a voice that, they've act that we've actually been considered. You know, like, that's a bit concerning, yeah? The legislation, however, ha has provided a really um, decent protective factor in this disaster situation, and it's shown to be a protective factor in COVID as well. The decriminalisation of sex work provides a sense of legitimacy for sex workers so that they feel entitled to support. They're able to access the, they're able to access the services, and so, the decriminalisation does mitigate the stigma a little bit. Um, they're also able to continue earning during the period of high surveillance where the military and the police were guarding the red zone. Street-based sex workers were able to go right back and stand next to them while they're waiting to meet clients. Sex workers are able to relocate easily and advertise freely and self-organise to work in peers or groups, unlike in other legislative models. So decriminalisation does provide a protective factor and mitigate issues of stigma. So in summary, we hope we've represented the way in which displacement, stigma and legislation matters after an extraordinary event like an earthquake and the impact that they might have on our sex worker communities. We've highlighted the value of peer-based and supportive organisation during adverse events. NZPC was pivotal and remains pivotal for sex workers during the COVID response and recovery stage here in Aotearoa. We advocate that official disaster organisations, including the government, liaise with a range of marginalised groups, including sex workers, and have them sit at the table well before a disaster strikes, so they can consider the specific needs of particular communities, and of course, have them at the table in the response and recovery processes. 
Sex workers are part of the community and must be included in all aspects of disaster response and recovery. So that's our presentation for now. We um, really thank you for being interested in this really, really important human rights topic and we wish you all the best. Namahi, mahi, mai oha, kia koutou, katoa. <laughs>